in fact, there's a, an image you probably all know, which is the blue marble image, and, and in fact, it transitions into a climate simulation. And I wanted to start with the blue, blue marble image um, because uh, it kind of, it, it's, an, it's an important image in, in the sense that it lends the idea of the Earth a sense of symmetry. It's a moral image. It gives it a sense of unity, um, an idea of fragility. Uh, it lends sense to this statement that we're all in it together. And I want to try to move away from this uh, today and to suggest that, in fact, we're not all in it together. There is no planet to save, no globe to redeem, no universal we, in fact, in which one might speak. What I want to suggest today is that it would be better to do away with these old images of thought and, uh, and to start again. Everything is not connected. Some relations dominate over others. Networks of dependence are not even, nor are they reciprocal. The earth knows neither unity or evenness. In fact, it's a system of force fields and pressure fronts fighting to reach uh, uh, equilibrium. And I want to try to make this clear with um, a case study that I've been working on, um, which has started prematurely here, um, but it's really about the geopolitics of climate change and some of the violence um, that, that attends to it. So we know that when fuels combust, um, or fuels have to combust to release energy. And there are a number of byproducts that emerge out of them, um, one of which is uh, CO2, which we're very familiar with. The other one is a, a series of very diverse particles called aerosols. And there are major differences between them. CO2 is long-lived in the atmosphere, meaning we can measure it in terms of parts per million and averages. Aerosol particles, on the other hand, are suspended in the atmosphere for about one to two weeks at a time, making them spatio-temporally patterned. So they're like traces in the planet's bloodstream. They reveal, in many ways, the architecture of the Earth. The previous animation you just saw was, um, was, was in fact, a simulation by NASA of, of, of these aerosol particles. And over the last decade, an astonishing picture um, about aerosols and their effects has, has emerged especially the way in which energy use in the Northern Hemisphere uh, is affecting rainfall around the tropics. Um, and the piece on the screen that you're looking at is a project that I completed for the recent uh, Forensic Architecture Exhibition in, in Berlin. And what it shows is the following. And I'll try to go through it sort of relatively quickly. Every single fossil fuel combustion in Europe and North America conspires to send a stream of small aerosol particles into the atmosphere. If these particles are emitted in the right kind of weather system, they will be carried high into the atmosphere, transported along air currents to the Atlantic Ocean. Here, suspended thousands of meters above the sea level, they will affect incoming and outgoing solar radiation, effectively changing the temperature of the sea below. This affects evaporation levels in the sea and transforms moisture supply, which in turn uh, changes the location, timing, and intensity of the monsoon that, uh, that brings annual rainfall to the Sahel. So if it's the case that an event in one part of the world triggers a climatic bifurcation in another, then tracking, mapping, and understanding these, um, these systems are more than a kind of problem in, in thermodynamics. In fact, what they are is the medium through which a future political claim can be made and potentially a present crime prosecuted. But what to make about, or what to make with um, a crime with no smoking gun? Where is the responsibility located in this complex causal chain? Well, if you remember, during the 2009 Copenhagen Climate Summit, the public debate was framed around two simple questions. Would an uh, accord be signed or not? And what would be the acceptable level of temperature increase? Would it be 1.5 degrees? Would it be 2 degrees, 3 degrees, etc.? During a private press conference, um, the leader of the G77, Lumumba de Arping, and the G77 is a group of 132 developing nations, um, declares a private press conference and famously breaks down in tears and, and says two things which went on to be very, very controversial. He says, A, we have been asked to sign a suicide pact in reference to the proposed Danish text and its two-degree temperature increase. And he also uses the word climate genocide. So the proposed two-degree average, of course, meant 3.5 degrees in many of the nations that uh, de Upping was there to, um, to, to represent. 
And what the Uppings claim of, 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 of genocide um, in fact refers to is that within every single dollar, uh, within every single degree, sorry, billions of dollars of GDP are con congealed. In fact, within these um, uh, scientific models uh, is a kind of non-scientific ethico-political paradigm. There's a kind of calculus of life and death disguised within them. And this leaves climate science in a unique position because the mechanics of the climate um, separate the cause from the effect. Um, the space of, of violence is separated from the space of its repercussion. So if we think that Edmund Lockhart's famous forensic principle, which is uh, every contact leaves a trace, uh, still holds, but with one impossible catch. In fact, the contact and the trace uh, start to drift apart. The climate loosens the bond between cause and effect. Um, in fact, it breaks the link between attribution, responsibility, and potentially justice. Furthermore, then, the, the consequence is no longer recognizable or even proximate to its cause. Humans are summoned to address a problem whose consequences they may never experience. Most of our institutions of justice, law, financial, legal redress are based on different kinds of experiences, experiences that are more familiar. And so my question, the question I'm passing back to the panel today, is before we can produce a new politics, which is, let's say, up to the task of dealing with some of these problems, perhaps we need to think of a new aesthetics, an aesthetics that somehow makes visceral um, and, and also understandable these very complex relationships that are uh, of, of cause and effect that are distributed over, over the surface of the earth in a way to an aesthetics that might bring the contact and the trace back together again, not so that these differences and entanglements will be annihilated, but so that they can be um, understood properly. I was just, I'm intrigued at what I'm going to be talking about in a moment. What I find fascinating, both in your film and what you're just saying, the cause and effect. Mm. So it means that anybody consuming oil coming out of Ghana or Nigeria in this country should have a sticker, see what kind of revolution is going on, how people live in the jungle, how many bullets have been fired or whatever way you want to express it. So to make clear that these, whatever you consume here has implies the life conditions, lifestyles of people in a very different part of the world that's not the same. If you want to have, uh, if you have 37,000 pounds here, it means that there's, I don't know how many people who only have one pound and that makes it possible. So that's the, the question of individual rights. So do we have another right to do that? So if you ask how could through design we express um, cause and effect, I'm almost tempted to throw the question back to you. Would that mean that every piece of consumption has a sticker, has a label, has a story to it? Or does it mean changing a larger narrative? Because the underlying issue is again the one of the community. Do we want to stand up for the rest of the world that's bearing the, the burden for our consumptive parents in this, in this country or in the Northern Hemisphere? And how can we express that? I don't think there's a we to start with. <laughs> you know, I mean, I think that's exactly the problem. You know, when, you, when, you, when we stand here and say, well, well we're going to put labels on, on products. So that, that, I mean, I don't, I don't think that's it at all. In fact, I, I think there's a huge role for, um, for, for cultural production. And in fact, I think that's, that's, in a way, the premise of... Um, of, of our invitation here, which is really to think these things in cultural terms and aesthetics, to come back to aesthetics as a way of um, making comprehensible some of these connections. I think the film is just an extraordinary example of that. Um, but I can imagine there must be other ways of, of also making these things visceral for us so that we can, so that we can understand them. I think we, we, you know, human beings are very bad at making decisions on things they can't experience, no? I mean, this is why we have religion, in fact, yeah? To, 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 uh, to say, well, no, just trust us because you need to act according to some kind of transcendental moral values, but of course our technocratic rationality or you know, market logics are, are totally different. No? We need to feel things um, to, to, to I, respond I, to them. So the question is like, then how do we create, what kind of cultural production is adequate to making us feel or know these things? For me, this, I mean, one, I think it's a fabulous question or a fabulous way of framing it as something that we can, that we can address. And I, um, I once tried to get Peter Singer to take seriously the, what, what I thought was a, related to your question, which was, you know, if I turn my thermostat up or down a half a degree, mm. that's having consequences years later on the other side of the world. Um, but somehow that is different than an immediate cause and effect relationship. For him it was, he said, 
if turning the thing causes the temperature, then it's wrong, you shouldn't do it. Mm. But I think it's precisely the degree of uncertainty that's present mm. in that connection how much, how big, you know, yeah. how certain, all those kinds of things. And, I, and, I, and I, I wonder if, you know, exactly the conversation we heard earlier about risk, um, which has become very much a term for financial analysis, yeah. whether that isn't the kind of thing you're trying to find ways to make visible. So it's not uh, yeah. certain. No, it's a, it's a fantastic question. In yeah. fact, the, the more and more uh, I, I looked at the research, the more and more something like a precautionary principle in which, you know, in indigenous cosmologies, even within like Judeo-Christian histories, yeah. no, there are certain things that are kind of off yeah. limits, yeah? Like nature, no, you yeah. don't, of course you don't yeah. do that to nature, yeah? And at a certain point, those, those things enter back into the frame because, um, of course, there, there, is, there, there is so much elongation between some of these networks of cause and effect that you can never string them back together again, you know? Um, the, the case study that I'm looking at, I think what's interesting about it is, is in fact that there is a push now even within uh, certain forms of critical legal studies to ask whether in fact you can start to consider these things as crimes. And so, but just but going back to your, I mean, I still think the think you, you found one way to make certain aspects of this visible mm. at a at a climate level, mm. and just thinking, you know, the ways, in what ways. Is risk at all visible mm. to us? I mean, you know, we point to things as potential consequences of a former action. Um, well, for example, I mean, in, in, during Copenhagen, um, it was qu quite clear, um, even though the agreement was frustrated, that a two degree increase would equate to, you know, somewhere in the order, and the estimates vary, of uh, additional hundreds of thousands of deaths in the African continent per year in coming decades, yeah? And that's not including, that's just water stress and reduced crop yields. That's not to do with exacerbating existing conflicts, mm -hmm. no? So, I mean, there's, I mean, the science, I have no reason to doubt the science, you know, yeah. at that level. Um, but this is the calculus um, that, that, that we're involved in. And, and I'm sorry. Okay, no, I thought there were... Um, no, I mean, I, one thing I was just going to say was it, uh, it's a fascinating uh, presentation. The thing that I've uh, often thought about uh, covering energy, and, and since I started writing about it, is the... It makes me think of William Burroughs' The Naked Lunch, mm. you know, where, you know, The Naked Lunch is the moment when everyone sees exactly what was on the end of their fork. And uh, it is, I think, until that point, until I'd been to, until I'd been to Nigeria, until I'd been to the oil sands of uh, uh, Western Canada or whatever, had no idea mm. that, that was... You know, the way that you know, the deck yeah. of my car got filled. No, no idea that that was the way the light came on. And obviously that's true of the vast majority of the public as well. Um, it, I think it's an interesting enterprise to think that you could bring that kind of insight and understanding sure. to, to the world. Um, What's interesting, like in, in architecture, the paradigm with energy is always around insulation. You know, it's like, how do you insulate? Yeah, how do you keep something yeah. kind of uh, you stop temperatures kind of exchange? In fact, it, it's it's more about like breaking that idea open. No? So in fact, that you know, in philosophical terms, that that in fact it's no longer about insulation. It's somehow about understanding the way you're immersed in this in this system of force fields and and, and understanding the relationships. Yeah. So this is actually one reason why I think uh, fracking and the whole shale boom has been very good for America is because actually you know the energy is being produced much closer to home now, and people get a much more kind of vivid sense of it if it's sure. happening only you know a few miles. Away in Pennsylvania, sure. as opposed to thousands of miles away in, in, the in Saudi Arabia, or, yeah. or, or, or although I Africa. think we do need to. Although I, 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 I have heard, and I, and I increasingly think this is true, that one of the big differences between the U.S. and, for example, Germany is the U.S. rightly or wrongly, and now it's back, thinks of itself as an energy producer. Right? It's something we make, even though we're just extracting it. Whereas a country like Germany has never been, you know, a net producer of fossil fuels. They had coal, a lot of coal. Yeah. They had a lot of coal, but. So every bit of oil is a bit of oil imported, and therefore, in Japan, same way. So I think, you know, the, the problems we're having in Pennsylvania are the problems we had there 100 years ago, you know? Um, so it's, again, I don't think it's something to be discounted, but I think there's an underlying psychology there.